You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. On Friday night, we ended in the middle of the death and investigation of the death of a man named Vincent Foster. Now, I'm not going to go into what led up to this again tonight. I'm just going to finish where we left off and hopefully tonight finish with this whole sordid thing. And it is sordid, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to begin with how they covered up the murder of Vincent Foster. First, ladies and gentlemen, they had to make sure none of Foster's incriminating papers were found. So contrary to standard police procedure, Foster's office was not immediately sealed. Instead, Chief White House Counsel Bernard Nussbaum, along with Hillary's Chief of Staff, Margaret Williams, and Clinton aide Patsy Thomason, the one who ran Dan Lasseter's bond company while he was in the halfway house, entered the office just hours after Foster was found. His body wasn't even cold yet. They spent two hours rifling through his office, taking out the sensitive documents on Whitewater and Travelgate, and those documents have never been made public. Next, they had to make sure no credible law enforcement agency would investigate Foster's death, and especially not the FBI. They dumped the body in a public park, and Clinton's Justice Department assigned the case to the Keystone Cops, called the Park Police. You see, the park police are normally in charge of crowd control. In the politically charged death of a key government official, they don't even know what to do. And this was proved by the incredible, insane way that they bungled the entire investigation. Other than an autopsy, no sophisticated investigation was done until much later. Though it's standard procedure to make the autopsy public six months later, that still has not happened, and don't look for it to happen, folks. The Park Police did no ballistic test on the weapon until four to five months after Foster died, so they don't know if the gun they recovered actually killed Foster. They recovered no bullet. They did not even search the death scene with a metal detector to recover the critical missing bullet, which should have been standard procedure. Witnesses reported seeing a van and a menacing-looking Hispanic man around Foster's car just before Foster's body was discovered, but the park police never had composite sketches made to identify this man. The truth is, the park police has never been trained in how to conduct a homicide investigation. They didn't seal Foster's office until two whole days after his murder. His office should have been sealed immediately. A former Washington police official stated, quote, I was completely shocked to have learned that Foster's office wasn't sealed immediately after his death, unquote. It was many months before the Park Police sent out Foster's clothing and the gun for forensic examination. Many months allowing deterioration of evidence. And who knows what happened to the clothing and the gun during that period of time. Who knows whether they were washed or not? Who knows exactly who handled that clothing and that weapon? You see, the clothing and the gun should have been sent out the day after the murder for forensic examination. But Park Police spokesman Major Robert Hines said the agency did not need forensics to make our conclusion that Foster committed suicide. Rather than sending evidence to the FBI gun lab, the finest in the world, the Park Police sent the evidence to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, BATF, the murderers, the people who conducted the massacre at Waco, Texas, the people who don't even work for the United States government, but for the International Monetary Fund under the United Nations, according to the Treaty of Bretton Woods. Well-placed sources at the BATF said they were very surprised to learn that Park Police claimed tests had been done at the BATF labs. They knew nothing about it. 
And, of course, if tests had been done there, they should have known something about it. Statements of paramedics on the scene strongly suggest Foster was murdered elsewhere, his body brought to the park where it was staged to look like a suicide. The paramedics who have since been forced by government officials to remain silent, and no one can be forced to remain silent, folks, which means they just don't have any backbone. Jellyfish sheeple is what I call them. They said it was the most unusual suicide they'd seen. A gunshot wound to the head should have blown out his entire back of his head. Blood and guts should have been spewed out all over the murder scene, but only a trickle of blood was found down Foster's cheek with no blood on the gun itself. Incredibly, they could find no exit wound. Later, the government said there was an exit wound. With the high-velocity cartridge of a thirty-eight, the gun should have been flung from the body, according to one pathologist, up to thirty feet away. It was found still being held in Foster's right hand, both arms at his sides. Foster himself should have been sprawled and contorted from the violence of the shot. Instead, he was found lying flat on his back, both legs straight, side by side, and the paramedics said it looked as though he had been laid out ready for the coffin. I think this was done to send a very clear message, quote, don't talk, unquote. Other people involved in the Clinton scams knew Foster. They would quickly see this was no suicide. At the same time, the spin doctors were able to convince the press Foster had somehow taken his own life. The so-called suicide note didn't show up until six days after Foster's death. It was unsigned, undated, ripped into 27 pieces, and contained no fingerprints. It was probably a page torn out of Foster's diary if he even wrote it, and certainly was not a suicide note. It never even mentioned a suicide. Nestbaum supposedly found it while going through Foster's briefcase, which he had taken from Foster's office, but FBI and Park Police agents watching Nussbaum rifle the office said they had a clear view of the briefcase and nothing was in it. The FBI has opened an obstruction of justice investigation into the events surrounding Foster's murder and cover-up, among other things, the FBI is questioning Nussbaum's handling of murder documents. The number two man in the Justice Department, Philip Heyman, took exception to the handling of the Foster investigation, and he was abruptly terminated by Bill Clinton through Janet Reno, the mastermind of the Waco Massacre. Heyman was a career justice lawyer who had been there through four Democratic administrations covering 33 years. He was in charge of the Justice Department's criminal division, which handles all criminal investigations. It's obvious, folks, that Mr. Heyman, an honest man, left a career position because he would not be party to another Clinton cover-up, this one Foster's murder. Why was Foster killed? We think there were three reasons. First, he bungled the cover-ups. Second, he knew too much, and he was showing signs of caving in. Finally, he was the perfect fall guy. He would become the hole where the documents could easily disappear. Clinton could say, quote, Foster had the documents, unquote. In Arkansas, it was a common saying, get Clinton to Washington so our money and our women will be safe. Clinton has always had a hankering for women, and as a powerful politician, he has indulged that hankering to the limit. Jennifer Flowers was the most public of his many affairs. She was a former cabaret singer, a striking-looking woman. Bill met her when she was in her early 20s. He quickly made her his mistress. Bill and Jennifer were frequently seen together at social functions across Arkansas. Flowers revealed intimate details of her long-term sexual relationship with Clinton. And she told when, where, and how. When prompted, she even told about Clinton's sexual prowess. Clinton betrayed his wife with this woman for 12 years. He put her on the state payroll. Of course, paying someone for a sexual relationship out of state funds directly violates state and federal law. When asked about his affair with Jennifer Flowers, Clinton hemmed and hawed, but he never, not once, ever denied it. At the same time, Clinton also had an ongoing affair with Sally Perdue, a former Miss Arkansas. She says state troopers used to bring Clinton in police cars to have sex with her. 
She also gives details of Bill's preferences, saying he liked to wear her black nightgown while he played the sax for her. Miss Perdue said she was later offered a cushy federal job to keep her mouth shut. That apparently was not unusual for Bill Clinton. U.S. News reported that among the controversies surrounding Clinton are that he used state funds to pay for sex with at least four other women besides Jennifer Flowers. Police officers say they brought women to Clinton for sex before and after he was elected president. And several Secret Service employees, Secret Service men assigned to guard the president, have resigned, ladies and gentlemen, because they didn't like, they didn't like being turned into pimps for both of the Clintons. Like John Kennedy, Clinton apparently did not stop his extramarital sex affairs after he was elected president. Arkansas state troopers say that as members of Governor Clinton's security staff, they were expected to set up a series of extramarital affairs and romantic adventures for him. They even say that they alerted Clinton where, whenever his wife was on the prowl, booked hotel rooms for his trusts, lent him unmarked police vehicles, and stood guard while he dallied in the back seat of parked police cars. The troopers say Clinton had multiple sexual encounters up until days before his inauguration. This included receiving oral sex in parking lots. He also had them deliver gifts to his girlfriends. And folks, this was not just one Arkansas State Trooper, nor two Arkansas State Troopers, but as many as eight. Did Clinton try to buy their silence? The Los Angeles Times reports there's credible evidence that, one, the troopers' allegations of sex are true, and two, Clinton violated federal criminal statute as re recently as fall of 1993. Two of the Arkansas policemen said Clinton tried to keep them from talking to reporters by suggesting he was willing to appoint them to high-paying federal jobs. Danny Ferguson was one of these troopers. He said Clinton phoned him several times to find out what he and the other policemen were saying. Clinton told Ferguson he wanted to come in the back door and shut it down. Roger Perry, one of the two troopers who went public just recently, confirmed what Ferguson said about the president's calls. According to Perry, Ferguson told him Clinton offered Ferguson his choice of two jobs. United States Marshal in Little Rock, paying $67,000 a year. Our regional director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, with a starting salary of $93,000 a year. And Clinton, of course, denies this. But he already has rewarded one of the four troopers, Buddy Young, with a FEMA regional directorship. According to a report in the Washington Times, Young's only qualification for the job appeared to be his success in suppressing bimbo eruptions. <laughs> Bimbo eruptions, which, of course, would have revealed Clinton's erections. According to Ferguson, Clinton also asked him to tell Perry that he could have anything he wanted. If the troopers' statements are true, and all the evidence says that they are, Clinton offered favors so the troopers would hold their tongues. That is in violation of a number of federal statutes, but it is totally in keeping with the character of the man we elected president, as you have discovered by listening to the previous three broadcasts of the Hour of the Time. On three different occasions, Nick Grano interviewed three Arkansas state prisoners. They all related the same basic story. While trustees, in effect, prisoners who had special privileges while in prison, they worked at the governor's mansion. During that time, they and other people they knew were used as couriers to escort the bag money in the high-stakes poker games involving Clinton and his cronies. As it was explained to Nick, the money was never around the poker games. The wealthy and powerful players in the poker games would buy their chips from the courier. When the game was over, they would go to a courier at a different location who would cash them out. They also told stories of obtaining women and drugs for participants in the game. Now, Nick has no way of knowing if these allegations are true, 
but they were in line with rumors that he heard through the years about Clinton's voracious appetites for women and gambling and rumors that have permeated uh, the social circles in Arkansas. One of Clinton's close friends was millionaire drug dealer Dan Lasseter. Now, I told you about the lucrative business deals Clinton gave to Lassiter. Lassiter showed his appreciation in more ways, ladies and gentlemen, than just cash. More ways than just cash. According to police files, Lassiter threw lavish parties, often with lines of cocaine and, of course, lots of beautiful women. It's even been rumored that Clinton attended these parties. He frequently flew around the United States with Lassiter and Lassiter's private jet. Clinton claims he stopped his relationship with Lassiter when he learned of his coming drug conviction. But witnesses report Governor Clinton continued to associate with Lassiter even after he had been informed that Lassiter was under investigation for drug dealing. In 1986, Lassiter was sentenced to 30 months in prison for distributing cocaine. One of the people he distributed to was Clinton's brother, Roger. He only spent four months in a halfway house and two months in home confinement. Bill Clinton, as we have already revealed, then gave him a full pardon. Just what could Clinton be doing at the wild parties of a soon-to-be-convicted drug dealer? Just what did he and Lassiter do in Lassiter's plane as they jetted all around the United States? Remember, Clinton admits to smoking pot as a college student. What might he get from a multi-millionaire wheeler dealer who would soon be convicted of distributing cocaine? No matter where you go in Arkansas, folks, you can find someone who has a story of Clinton's love of sex and gambling. I have talked to many people who told me about high-stake poker games and encounters Clinton had with women in hotel rooms. Nick Guarmo has spoken to these same people and many more and has discovered the same allegations. Every other month, a new person comes forward who has knowledge of Clinton's immoral escapades involving sex or money. In February 1994, still another woman spoke out. It was the same old pattern. She was a campaign worker. She was beautiful. She says Clinton aides told her Clinton wanted to speak with her in a private room. When she got there, he asked for sex. Unlike many, she refused, but like all the others, she was immediately discredited by Clinton's spin doctors. Now, we're not talking about some Hollywood sex symbol or superstar athlete. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the President of the United States of America. He is the Commander-in-Chief of the world's greatest military power. He is charged with protecting the citizens of this country. He is a man who is supposed to be above corruption. Huh. If this man cannot control himself morally, what danger are we in? During the 1992 campaign, Hillary and Bill appeared on numerous TV shows, including 60 Minutes. In that interview, Bill never denied his sexual escapades. Not once, not even a hint of denial. But he did indicate all these mistakes were behind him. You may remember his sincerity. The moment was really touching. The silly, stupid little grin was there, as it always is. But we don't believe that he had any intention of stopping then or now. It was just a ruse to get elected, and that is the ultimate danger of Bill Clinton. He is completely amoral. He is a true sociopath. He will say or do anything to get what he wants. He has no conscience. No feeling, no empathy for other people. I doubt if he even understands that other people have feelings. Only in America can a poor country boy go from a dead broke political hack to a multi-millionaire and president of the United States. But Bill Clinton's is not a Horatio Alger story. He's closer to Al Capone. His story is so complex that most people lose the significance of the events that took place. As governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton and his cronies looted a savings and loan, the SBA and the Arkansas Development Bond Authority. He needed money and power to finance a bid for his ultimate goal, the presidency. He dabbled with the Central Intelligence Agency's 
efforts to import drugs into the United States through the airstrip at Mena, Arkansas. He wined and dined with a man who was convicted of distributing cocaine. Over 28 bodies litter the ground around Bill Clinton. People closely connected to him who have died under mysterious circumstances within just the last couple of years, folks. Three, if you will remember, during the massacre at Waco, Texas. Bill Clinton himself admitted that three of the BATF agents killed during the initial assault on the church known as Branch Davidian, probably by friendly fire, had been his personal bodyguards during his presidential campaign. Don't go away. There's more. Clinton set up his cronies in key positions. They arranged sham real estate deals. They inflated the value of property that was basically worthless. And they borrowed millions of dollars against those properties. Most of these deals, folks, involved very inexpensive land on which they borrowed far more than actual value. When they were done, all these projects showed enormous losses and remarkably all the borrowed money is gone. All, not part, folks, all the borrowed money is gone. The plan, of course, was fraudulent and illegal. It was also successful beyond Clinton's wildest dreams. As governor, Clinton held near total control of the state, the bond authority, the banking authorities, the securities commissions. He could give jobs when he needed it. He could borrow money and authorize money to be loaned to his cronies. He controlled a billion-dollar political plum, the unimaginable wealth of the Arkansas state bond authorities. They loaned out literally a billion dollars to his associates, friends, and favored projects. Now remember, they loaned out literally a billion dollars to his associates, friends, and favored projects. And we have already told you, folks, all the borrowed money is gone. Madison Guarantee was looted for $60 million or more, probably much, much more, but no one will ever really know. For all the records have disappeared, deeds have disappeared, <laughs> checks have disappeared, financial records have disappeared. Loans have disappeared. In the next ten years, many bonds issued under the Clinton administration will go into default. And that $60 million figure is going to appear like a speck of sand on a California beach compared to the losses that will be experienced by those who purchase those bonds. Clinton was governor over several million people and stole millions. And if you count the bond deals as stealing, which they certainly were, billions of dollars. He's now president, ladies and gentlemen, over 260 million people. And I might remind him that we still have our guns. He controls trillions of dollars, and his pattern of lies and deceits has continued right on. NAFTA, government health care, ever higher taxes, the socialization of America's great free enterprise system are all a part of the great plan to pull this nation down and bring together their dream, this great socialist dream of a one-world totalitarian state. Clinton has just one problem, ladies and gentlemen. Just one little problem out of all the many that he faces. And that problem is he will be impeached. What the establishment press, the socialist-controlled press in this country has suppressed, I have revealed, and it can no longer be hidden. 
Every dirty deed he ever did in Arkansas is starting to bubble to the top of the cesspool he created, and it stinks. The filth will bury him, just as he has tried to bury it. As white water continues to unfold, the important thing to keep in mind is that there will be few smoking guns. Witnesses with direct evidence will be silenced, discredited, because you stupid sheeple. Ah, <laughs> uh, never mind. Or they'll just change their testimony. Clinton will constantly claim it wasn't him. Keep your overview, folks, about these events. Understand that except in the beginning, his name appears on nothing. No money goes directly to him. It's all disappeared. And it's disappeared into the arms for drugs operations of the Military Intelligence Network and the Central Intelligence Agency. Operated and controlled by the secret societies whose headquarters is just 13 blocks from the White House in Washington, D.C. They consist of the Sovereign and Military Order, the Knights of Malta, the Knights Templar, the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of the Southern Jurisdiction, B'nai B'rith, the Rosy Cross, and many others. But isn't it? Isn't it remarkable how everyone around Bill Clinton is involved in one dirty deal after another, all intermingled, and how directly or indirectly he and Hillary benefited from them? When Bill first became governor of Arkansas, he and Hillary had no assets whatsoever. Their net worth was basically zero. In college, Hillary was the girl that you wouldn't get caught dead dating. If you don't believe that, just look at a picture of her during those years. Bill Clinton was a poor young man back by powerful financial interests, backed by the wealthy of the world and the intellectual elite of the universities that he attended. He was given a Rhodes Scholarship. Why? Why did this poor white trash get that kind of backing, and how did he and Hillary, the girl no one would be caught dead on a date with, how did they get to the White House? When Bill first became governor of Arkansas, remember, he and Hillary had no assets. Their net worth was zero. Even with Hillary's law earnings and even with the backing of the elite of the world, Bill Clinton had nothing. They made only a modest salary. And now, only... Folks, only 16 years later, they both are multi-millionaires, and there's no logical way to explain it. No lawyer in Arkansas makes that much money, partner or not. And of course, Bill Clinton's salary was a pittance. Yes, folks, politics can pay, but it's time for the truth about the Clintons to come out in the open, and it's time for them to pay the piper. Clinton and Hillary are going to deny everything that I have said in this series of broadcasts, and that's how he has risen to his position of unbelievable power and money. And so I read... Read directly from a direct challenge made to Bill Clinton by Nick Grano. And I quote, Bill, take a lie detector test. Answer the charges that I have brought. 
I only put two requirements on it. One, that the test be administered by an expert you and I both agree is impartial. And two, that I get to ask the questions. You see, I don't want you to weasel out of it. Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, if Clinton is innocent, this would prove it to the whole world. But he will never take such a test, nor are we... Will he reveal the documents to the public that could also clear him? For they would convict him. And it would show that he is not innocent. It would make him, quote, the impeached president, unquote. And I so dub him now the impeached president. And I call upon you, Bill Clinton, to step down, do the honorable thing for once in your life, and resign from the presidency. Don't pull the presidency down with you, and don't put any more dirt in the face of the nation. If you don't do this, William Clinton, you will be the first president in American history to be formally removed from office through the impeachment proceedings, and you will go directly from the Oval Office to cell block C. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not an idle statement. This is based upon over a year of diligent research by many people. Many people. It is based upon interviews with many, many witnesses, acquaintances, and business partners of Bill and Hillary Clinton. It is based upon revelations made by Arkansas State Police officers and by at least four women who have publicly stated, with no gain to themselves, that they have been involved in sexual trice with William Clinton. The drugs, oh yes, the drugs, lead from Mena, Arkansas, to Lassiter, to Clinton, through the head of his personal bodyguards, who, by the way, is no longer in that position. The investigation into the drugs at Mena, Arkansas was very tightly controlled. Very little of the results of that investigation have ever been made public Ask Ollie North. I just received a letter from Ollie North wanting me to contribute $2,000 to his political campaign so that he can become the Senator of Virginia. And I say to those of you who live in Virginia, if you elect Ollie North, then you are the biggest fools upon the face of this planet. For Bill Clinton might be in the process of destroying the nation. But he's doing it slowly in a method that might allow us to defeat it. Ollie North was preparing a plan to summarily and precipitously suspend the Constitution of the United States of America and declare martial law. He was also involved in selling arms for drugs. The drugs that were brought into this country that are destroying the youth of the nation, that are enslaving many poor people in ghetto neighborhoods, to create the inflated crime rate, to cause the sheeple to scream, to have the guns taken out of the hands of American patriots. Ollie North is a traitor. Find another conservative candidate, another candidate who is truly pledged to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Ollie North is a joke. Bill Clinton is a joke. Hillary Clinton is a joke. And you, the sheeple of the United States of America, unless you change your ways, you are the biggest joke of all. The biggest joke of all time. 
of the whole history of the world of all the fools that have ever lived, none can top the American sheeple who have it all and are shoveling it away from them just as fast as they possibly can on the promise of some future utopia. <laughs> Someone once said, what fools these mortals be. I wonder who said that. Was that Shakespeare? What fools these mortals be. Ladies and gentlemen, form your militia units. To arms, to arms, to arms, to arms. That is what our forefathers gave us, the second article in Amendment 4, was to protect ourselves against a government run amok. And that is exactly what is happening. Constitutional government has not failed us. We have failed it. And the scum has risen directly to the top because we've been asleep all these years and they are in control. There will be no political resolution. There will be no relief in the courts. Our duty, our responsibilities are clear. And if you haven't got the guts for it, May God have mercy on your soul, and I hope you have the guts to keep your mouth shut when you discover that slavery is no fun. Good night. God bless you, and God save the Republic.